Hello, my name is Doug Dorch, minister at Captiva Chapel by the Sea. Thank you for joining me today as we consider a brief message on how we best show our faith in Christ by not letting the sun go down on our anger, a message that I hope will give you some encouragement for your day. I love deadlines. Even in my retirement, I find that I need deadlines to keep me focused on important tasks that I can't afford to let slip up on me. And you may be the same way. You may love deadlines too. But even if you don't, you still have to learn how to live with deadlines. After all, rare is the person who can make it through life without having to deal with some kind of deadline. There are tax deadlines, and there are medical appointment deadlines, and there are special project deadlines. There are party deadlines in terms of having to indicate if we'll attend or not. Sooner or later, we all have to find a way to incorporate deadlines into our everyday life. Well, evidently, God loves deadlines also because because the Bible is filled with them. Choose you this day whom you will serve, Joshua said to the children of Israel. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes the judgment, says the book of Hebrews. And then there's this one from the book of Ephesians that I want us to consider. Do not let the sun go down while you are angry. Now that's Paul writing to the Ephesians. Paul, of course, was a good Jew prior to his coming to faith in Christ, and he had grown up with this most natural of deadlines. You see, the sunset was a natural limit for the Jewish people, as the Jewish day technically ended at sundown, not at midnight as our days do. And so even to this day, the Sabbath for the Jews begins on sundown on Friday and ends the same time on Saturday. And then in Bible times, there were certain economic transactions that were expected to be accomplished by sundown. For example, in Deuteronomy, Day laborers were expected to receive their daily wages by the setting of the sun because, as the text says in Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, the day laborer is poor and he's counting on it. And of course, when Jesus was crucified, you'll remember that it was essential for the Jewish leaders that the Romans removed Jesus' body and the bodies of those crucified with him by sundown in accordance with Sabbath customs. And that is why Paul was so inspired by the Holy Spirit to use this most natural of deadlines as motivation for the believers in Ephesus to go to whatever links might be necessary to keep the devil from using the emotion of anger to divide them and to keep them from advancing the cause of Christ in the Ephesian community. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now this particular section of Ephesians deals with how Christians are to live as children of the light. You see, Paul had this vision of the church as being a place where people might be able to move beyond their grievances with others so that they might model for the outside world the difference that mercy and grace can make in our relationships with one another. And Paul knew that of all the tools in the devil's possession, our anger is the one that we too often make readily available to him so that the devil might use it to keep us from fulfilling God's mission. In other words, God can never use our anger toward one another to serve his kingdom purposes. Only Satan can. And so, 
it's essential that we that we address our anger because of how dangerous it is to the unity of the church and the fellowship that we are seeking to form as the body of Christ. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever had to deal with a person who is angry? Well, I'm sure that that you have at some point along the way because, well, we live in such an angry age. I'm not talking about mild discomfort or, or a general feeling of being perturbed about something. I'm talking about what the Greeks called a short madness, the kind of human eruption that that blows to smithereens everything and everyone in its wake. In the same way that Mount Vesuvius erupted and buried the ancient city of Pompeii, how many relationships have been destroyed because of the anger that has been unleashed by one, if not by both of the parties involved? So there is no doubt but that Paul sensed how the church at Ephesus was about to erupt in this way because of some unresolved anger. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have been inspired to offer these verses for his reader's spiritual growth and development. What makes this particular emotion such a challenge is because it's natural. After all, who among us doesn't get angry Every day we have multiple chances to get angry. Another driver cuts in front of you. Someone criticizes you. Another person doesn't recur return your call or your text or your email or, or all three. These are all what someone has called anger invitations. And I would add that they are the equivalent of emotional junk mail. And I know what you are thinking. You're thinking, aren't there some things that we should be angry about? And indeed there are, otherwise God wouldn't have created us with the ability to get angry. Even Paul concedes that when he begins this section, he says, in your anger, verse 26, in your anger do not sin. And yet, you know as well as I know that there is no more overused term today than righteousness indignation. And that so much of our anger in reality stems from hurt that has been done to us, wounds that others have caused to our sense of self-worth. In fact, you may be listening today and and that's precisely the emotion that you're struggling with, and it's getting the best of you. The truth of the matter is that your anger is eating you up. So how do you deal with it? Well, the first step is to examine it, examine your anger, and see where it's coming from. Anytime I find myself getting angry, I have to stop, take a step back, and ask myself the question, is this about God? Or is this about Doug? And if it's about God, then I need to find cons constructive ways to allow my anger to motivate me toward righteous activity. And if it's about Doug, then I need to find a way to get rid of it, just as Paul says, as quickly as possible. Because the anger that is self-focused is an anger that only hinders the cause of Christ. And the best way to get rid of our unrighteous indignation is to follow the example of Jesus and to offset our anger with grace. Because Jesus did get angry. He got angry with the money changers in the temple who had turned God's house of prayer into a den of thieves. He got he got angry with the Pharisees when they questioned him about his healing of a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, both of those times. The anger of Jesus was God-directed, not self-focused. He was angry because those situations were most definitely ones over which God himself was angry. 
But you know, the one time that Jesus could have been angry out of selfish reasons was the time that he chose not to be. And I'm thinking, of course, about the cross. Mocked and reviled, stripped of his dignity, unjustly condemned, Jesus could have come down from the cross and shown them his righteous indignation. Or he could have called down fire from heaven as his disciples James and John once pleaded for Jesus to let them do. Or he could have prayed to God for the ground around the cross to open up and swallow all of his detractors as Moses did to the sons of Eliab when they opposed him in the wilderness. That story's in the book of Numbers, the 16th chapter. He could have done any or all of those things, but he didn't. What did Jesus do? He took pity on them, and he showed mercy to them, and he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is why Paul, appealing to the Ephesians to come together, knowing that there were some unresolved anger issues threatening to divide the church counseled his readers in Ephesus to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's Ephesians 4.32. So can you do that today, even if you're justifiably angry at the wrong that someone has done to you? Can you do what we might call the Jesus thing? Can you choose to forgive? Can you offset your anger with mercy and with grace? Because you see the sun is setting and time is wasting. So right now, Give your anger to God so that God might empower you to address the wrongs that are done against his will, and he might enable you to shrug off the deep hurts to your sense of self as God assures you of his unfailing love. And when that happens, not only will God win the victory, be certain, my brother and sister, so will you. For when forgiveness triumphs over anger, victory will belong to you. Thanks so much for listening today. Now you be careful not to let the sun go down on your anger today. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.